Yes, so, so today what I'm going to tell you about is, genome, is data integration, genome by transcriptome by EMR, but it's on the way to um, genome by transcriptome by ENCODE to EMR. So I'm, I'm here to learn more about using every, all the new tools in ENCODE just like the rest of you. And the purpose for me is, is all about um, the genetic component to common disease. I think data integration is one of those things that is extremely helpful in getting us to the, just the few remaining questions we have on the role of genetic variation in disease. Like what, what are the genes? What are the mechanisms? What are the directions of effects? And where are those rare variants? So we've spent a lot of time in my group um, trying to get at functional genomics, at the function of genome variation, most specifically. And I think, you know, so, so most of what we have worked on is this sort of um, pathway where we start with genome variation. Oops, let's see. Start with genome variation and, and assume that genome variation has an effect on transcript levels in some cases. Now, of course, things besides genetics influence transcript levels, and so we get some distribution around that genetically determined effect, and, and we presume beyond some threshold of, of expression in some genes, you can become affected. And so that's a, a sort of a generic model. Um, within GTEx, people have used creative ways to characterize, to sort of look at how regulatory variation concentrates heritability. Um, so this is the heritability with GCTA for type 1 diabetes using all SNPs that are interrogated in the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium GWAS for type 1 diabetes. So you see about, um, so about 48 percent heritability for type 1, about 50 percent heritability for Crohn's disease. But concentrated with just the few thousand SNPs that are characterized as EQTLs in adipose, you see almost 40 percent of that heritability um, in just a few thousand SNPs that are EQTLs in adipose or heart or lung or muscle. Um, and, and so across the board for type 1 diabetes, you see this regulatory architecture concentrating heritability. And, and this is indeed essentially the same set of SNPs regulating the same set of genes in a set of, uh, so it's shared regulatory architecture across all of these tissues. But for Crohn's disease, it's a completely different pattern. You see concentration of heritability in whole blood, which has, of course, all those cells that are so important in inflammatory disease, but you don't see much concentration of heritability across all these other cell types. So a, a key take-home message is, yes, you get this concentration of heritability, but it's not EQTLness per se, because it's the very same set of EQTLs concentrating heritability here for type 1 diabetes and failing to concentrate heritability for Crohn's disease. Um, and so it's a feature of the genetic architecture, this ability to concentrate heritability in regulatory elements. And our colleagues at uh, Harvard and the Broad did us one better. So with Alcus's Price, Alcus Price's group's paper at the end of uh, the year in 2014, where they combined um, 11 common diseases together as disease and compared it with controls and used basically ENCODE annotations to show that, yeah, about 40 percent of heritability, of, of all the heritability that you get with all variants can be concentrated into the, the variants that you directly interrogate that lie in DNAs1 hypersensitivity sites, but if you use the imputed data, it's closer to 80 percent of the common variant heritability is concentrated in SNPs that map to DNA one hypersensitivity sites, which is remarkable. And, 
and yes, it varies by disease. So this is a concatenation of, of a bunch of diseases, and it's heavily representing um, autoimmune disorders, for example. So, but, so this, this does vary, but whether it's 60% or 80%, that's a remarkable concentration of the common variant heritability into what we see as DNA variation that must be, in a sense, regulatory and probably regulatory at the level of transcriptomes. And so that, that led us to think about the analysis of this data in a different way, of these data in a different way. Think of it as a missing data problem. So if we really believe that a substantial fraction of the genome variation affecting risk of common disease is regulatory, why not focus our analysis on endophenotypes that, that are more direct measures of what we really want? So the genetically determined part of transcript levels. And instead of testing individual SNPs or test, testing individual SNPs and asking after the fact, are they regulatory, um, let's aggregate those variants into SNP-based predictors of transcript levels and then test these predicted transcript levels directly for association with disease or relevant quantitative traits. So this is the brainchild of a talented young faculty member at the University of Chicago that I sincerely hope will be a talented young faculty member at Vanderbilt soon. She's a really out-of-the-box thinker, and this is an out-of-the-box idea. It takes a while to wrap your mind around the notion of, of testing a calculated endophenotype, genetically predicted expression. And the, the manuscript describing the method um, and, and initial applications um, is in press in Nature Genetics now as a GTEx companion paper. But, but if you think about a decomposition of measured transcript levels, some part of it is completely genetically determined. A substantial part of it is, of course, all those non-genetic factors that influence what we measure as transcript levels. And over a lifetime, the environmental influences on transcript levels and the lifetime of genetically determined transcript levels lead us to have certain diseases that feed back and and, and change, the diseases you have change your measured transcript levels as well, which is all, why, why it's been so confounding to try to use measured gene expression to figure out what drives disease. Because if we, you know, measure transcript levels in blood cells in kids with asthma and kids without, there are thousands and thousands of genes differentially expressed between cases and controls. Most of that as a consequence of disease not a cause. But here, we're going to focus on just the genetically determined part of transcript levels and, and look at the association of that phenotype with our disease. That finesses this problem, so we don't, we don't have the confound. Um, and it's very similar to the ideas in genome imputation, very analogous to genome imputation. So with genome imputation, we use thousand genomes as the reference panel to learn the correlations between DNA variants due to linkage disequilibrium and then use that information so that when we've genotyped just a subset of the total sequenced variants in thousand genomes with some genotyping chip, we can impute millions of addition additional variants. Here we're going to use GTEx as our reference panel and learn the the relationship between the genome variation and the measured transcript levels. We can store that, those, the weights from these prediction equations, and then basically in any data set where we have genome interrogation um, at, at at least the common variant level, so that can be whole genome sequencing, but it can just be a GWAS as well, you can basically impute transcript levels in all tissues measured in GTEx and use that as an endophenotype to do a gene-based test on, trans on whether genetically determined transcript levels are associated with your phenotype of interest. Now, of course, heritability represents the upper limit on how well you could do with such a method, right? Because we're using only the genome variation to impute the transcript levels. Fortunately, 
there are plenty of transcripts that have very high heritability. Um, so what you, what you see here is the prediction performance R squared. So this is an out of sample comparison of the predicted transcript level to the directly measured transcript level. Um, and, and we're showing this by the heritability, the GCTA based uh, mixed model, linear mixed model based heritability of the trait. So the black line um, is the actual measured estimated heritability. The red dots are the, is the R squared prediction performance. So the more highly heritable the trait is, the, the better the prediction performance is. And for any given tissue, there are a substantial number of genes with quite reasonable heritabilities, right? So, so all the genes down here, you're not going to do very well predicting. Um, but in some tissues, those genes will be up in this part of the curve, most of them. And so the, on average, um, so we see the significance of the correlation between predicted and directly measured expression levels um, have Q values. Uh, less than 0.05 for 40 to 50 percent of genes, less than 0.1 for 60 to 70 percent of genes. So the significance of that correlation. Um, 80 percent of genes have a correlation between predicted and measured expression um, greater than 0.1, and 50 percent of genes have a correlation between the predicted and the directly measured greater than 0.2. And a substantial number of genes have that correlation greater than 0.5, 0.6, there's plenty with, with, with that correlation being greater than 0.8, which is a remarkable set of genes where the environment is hardly impinging on the expression of those genes, and yet the population has wide range of variability, completely genetically determined. I mean, essentially, completely genetically determined. So really interesting from an evolutionary perspective set of genes. The, the, the prediction models that turn out to be the best probably tell us something about the genetic architecture of cis regulatory variation because with the sample size in GTEx now we're still using just the cis uh, regulatory variants. So polygenic prediction did not do as well as lasso or elastic net. Um, the, suggesting that this is, I mean, a more penalized models, um, more sparse models, actually do a better job than polygenic prediction. As your sample size increases, it makes less and less difference which predictor, predictive model you use. Um, but, but right now we've been using elastic nest, net because it's the most robust. So regardless of which genotyping product you used in your GWAS and, and the quality of your imputation, the elastic net tends to be more robust in terms of the, the prediction. The idea, the advantages of the framework is that we're, we're iteratively using more and more of what we do know, all of this information on how genome variation relates to transcript levels, to learn what we most want to know. What are the genes? We get genes with this test, right? It's a gene-based test. We get directions of effects. Um, it's a much more natural way to move into pathway and network analyses. Um, so, so the discovery level information is better. So the other thing we're, we're looking at is using this in the analysis of whole genome sequence data as a way to combine, unify the common and rare variant contributions because you're getting the gene level information. You can imagine combining the common variant gene level information on the regulatory end of things with the rare variant information on the functioning of the, the protein itself. Um, and so now I'm going to tell you about the uh, integration with the electronic medical records. So ever since we worked with Andre Rzhetsky on this cell paper where Andre used 130 million electronic medical records to show that each common disease has a characteristic set of Mendelian diseases that are overrepresented among the common diseases. He called it a Mendelian barcode. And so ever, ever since we worked on that paper, I've been obsessed with understanding the continuum between Mendelian and complex common diseases, and the continuum between loss of function mutations, deleterious amino acid polymorphisms, and just reduced expression of genes. And so, 
so now um, we've been thinking about how we can use PredictScan in this context um, to, to potentially validate and prioritize rare variant discoveries. So, so the idea is PredictScan itself involves an integration of transcriptome and genome variation. Um, so using GTEx, for example, as a reference panel to, to really make this, this relationship to validate pri and prioritize rare variant discoveries, you have to do further integration with what I'd call a phenome reference panel. And having moved to Vanderbilt, have I got a phenome reference panel for you? So the, at Vanderbilt, there's uh, the clinical data warehouse is called the synthetic derivative. And so you get a de-identified and continuously updated image of the electronic medical record with now 2.3 million subjects. Vanderbilt built their own EMR more, about 30 years ago, and so you have a really longitudinal set of data. In addition, they, until um, just this year, they had an opt-out procedure for collecting samples. So their biobank has more than 200,000 subjects. Um, they, they moved to prospective consenting um, by, as per NIH requirements now, but they're really not, there's really no change in the rate of sample accrual with the um, prospective consents because it, with the opt-out, we removed a random set of individuals to make sure that nobody knew who was in or out of the database, and now we don't have to do that. So it ends up um, being a wash in terms of the rate of, recruit, the rate of accrual. Um, right now, there's about 20,000 samples with GWAS level data, 42,000 with exome chip. Um, but by, by the end of 2015 or beginning of 2016, um, there will be more than 2.5 million subjects in the synthetic derivative. Um, we'll have dense genotype or whole genome sequencing on more than 100,000. Um, with, with exome chip data on all of those individuals, exome chip interrogation. And that's a dandy phenome reference panel. So you guys are all familiar with the, the idea of GWAS, but with BioView, you can do a FEWAS, so a phenome-wide association study. And the way they've done that in the past is to use individual functional variants or individual variants that were, say, the top signal for atrial fibrillation. And then you can look at what other phenotypes across the entire medical record are associated with that apparently functional SNP. So what besides atrial fibrillation um, is associated with the top SNP for atrial fibrillation? And to do FIWAS, you have to have a very large cohort of patients with both genotype data and many different diagnoses. The idea with BioView now, though, is that we can use PredictScan to do gene-based VWAS across the entire cohort. And gene-based VWAS for, for different expression of genes in different tissues, so cardiac tissues for heart disease, um, brain for neuropsychiatric phenotypes. And that, that really makes BioView into a phenome reference panel. So the given my obsession with the questions around Mendelian disease genes, the natural question was what phenotypes are associated with reduced genetically regulated expression of Mendelian disease genes? The, our, our hypothesis was, if this is going to work, you would expect the entire spectrum of the Mendelian disease to be represented in individuals across BioView who just have reduced expression of these genes. So, the, so, of course, it's all, even though we've got 20,000 with genotype data, it's on all different um, GWAS products, and the quality of the imputation wasn't quite where it needed to be, so we're still, we're re-imputing. So that these analyses have been done on just the 5,000 BioView subjects done with the Illumina 1M, which is the largest number of individuals done with any given single GWAS product. And we focused just these preliminary studies on, um, the, the genes where all the SNPs in the prediction equation are directly interrogated on that product in either um, a whole blood predictor, which we actually built from the depression gene network data because it's bigger than what we have in GTEx now, it's more than 900, um, or the cardiac tissue, so that's uh, 
uh, I think I u we used left ventricle, um, built from more than 300 individuals in GTEx. So we have 125 genes, so that's, that's the data set I'm showing you. Um, but it's already really interesting. So PEX19 is one of a set of 12 genes from this gene family where recessive mutations lead to a peroxisomal biogenesis disorder called the Zellweger syndrome spectrum of Mendelian phenotypes. So the kids with this disease are born with hypotonia, they have seizures, they have what's called bony stippling in the patella and the long bones showing bone resorption in those areas um, on, on, on uh, x-ray. You see kidney and liver cysts. The liver cysts lead to coagulopathies. The kidney cysts and also kidney stone formation uh, lead to renal failure. Um, PEX19 actually is, is one of the rarest causes of the Zellweger syndrome because it, it, the kids are, I mean, it's a, the most severe form of this um, Zellweger syndrome spectrum. And so we looked at what BioView phenotypes are associated with reduced genetically determined expression of PEX19 because all of the SNPs in the predictor for PEX19 were directly genotyped. And so what you see are the top association is with uh, an ICD-9 code given to kids that they think need a screen for chromosome anomaly or genetic disorder. So they, the kids, probably have hypotonia, maybe have seizures at birth. But you see kidney failure, hypertensive heart or renal disease, hypertensive chronic kidney disease, epilepsy, kidney replaced by transplant, so kidney failure, um, fracture of the patella. So again, this bone resorption uh, of the patella is seen, partial epilepsy, um, epile recurrent seizures. So. So essentially all of these features you're seeing as associated with reduced genetically determined expression. You also see the um, disorders of calcium and phosphorus metabolism, hyperparathyroidism, disorders of par parathyroid. The peroxisomes are a calcium store in cells and if kids with Zellweger syndrome lived long enough they would probably have these disorders. So my uh, Mendelian experts tell me. So really interesting set of phenotypes associated with reduced expression of PEX19. But because of the work that's been done on the, the genes that regulate peroxisomal biogenesis genes, we actually know what to expect for increased expression of PEX19. And you actually see exactly the phenotypes that you would expect associated with increased expression of this gene as well. So you see primarily cancer phenotypes, um, metabolic syndrome associated with increased expression of PEX19. So again, pretty much exactly in line with expectations. Another Mendelian disorder that we looked at is, uh, leads to a mitochondrial, um, a mitochondrial depletion syndrome. It's a DNA synthetase for mitochondria. So you basically don't, uh, don't replicate DNA, DNA, so you lose mitochondria rapidly over time. Um, the, the kids are born often with droopy eyelids. They have the inability even to move their eyes after a while. They lose the ability, if they ever walk, they lose the ability to walk even to breathe so that they lose the ability to, to really use muscles. A uh, recent study in Finland on a series of patients there suggested that they have increased fractures, although the paper said they didn't know if that would be because they fall down more because of the muscle weakness or they actually have bone weakness due to mitochondrial depletion in bone. And so what do we see in, in BioView with reduced expression? We actually see the ptosis of the eyelid. So you see the ptosis of the eyelid, um, which is a, a sort of the canonical thing. But you see fractures everywhere, skull fractures, tibial fractures, rib fractures, um, femur fractures. So a really interesting potential. Um, it's possible they just fall down more, but I think um, it'll be interesting to test. And I got a, a guy who is very interested in mitochondrial diseases, working on the possibility that bones really are more fragile. Increased expression of this same gene is associated with paraproteinemia and multiple myeloma, 
And so that would be unexpected, but a, a really interesting idea for what might happen if you have mitochondria on steroids, able to reproduce more rapidly than, than expected. Um, and so, so we're looking at this as well um, in a much larger series in multiple myeloma. This raises a question of whether altered expression, increased or decreased, of Mendelian disease genes might contribute disproportionately to common disease. So you saw kidney failure with PEX19. A lot of Mendelian disease genes have kidney failure as part of their spectrum. And if reduced expression of those genes leads to kidney failure, that may be a substantial contributor to what we see as garden variety kidney failure. In addition, for some, so for some genes, some Mendelian disease genes, we see additional phenotypes. Um, hemochromatosis, we think, you know, we think of as ha being associated with certain phenotypes, and we see some of those phenotypes um, associated in individuals in BioView, the cardiomegaly, for example. And, but we see additional phenotypes. So most people with hemochromatosis in the U.S. have uh, uh, mutations as a cause, as opposed to loss of function um, mutations. So they just have a polymorph amino acid changes that are deleterious that lead to uh, the disease. But in BioView, we see really strong associations with kidney failure. We know that actually iron does accumulate in kidneys in people with hemochromatosis. It's not reported to cause kidney failure, but sig significantly reduced expression of this gene may lead to kidney failure. And that's something we'll be looking at as we go forward. Um, just, I'll just close with a few examples of, um, so, so we think that if, if with Mendelian diseases, if, you, if reduced expression of Mendelian diseases are essentially reproducing the, the Mendelian phenotypic spectrum, then you could use something like BioView to refine phenotypes of existing Mendelian diseases and characterize new ones, basically predict what the Mendelian phenotype will look like um, when, when, as, you know, with the undiagnosed diseases program and the Mendelian diseases programs um, go forward, um, we'll have a, a way to match things up. With these undiagnosed diseases programs where you've got an individual with a set of phenotypes that suggest strongly that there's a genetic basis for the disease they have, but nobody knows what it is, when you do exome sequencing, you often have half a dozen or a dozen genes that could be the driver. We could go into BioView, when we have more than 100,000 subjects genotyped, we can go into BioView and look at what, which of these dozen genes have the set of phenotypes most similar to, uh, for reduced expression of the genes, most similar to what we see in the individual. And of course, with many of the sequencing studies that we're doing even today. So in type 2 diabetes, for example, with very large numbers of exome sequences done, we don't have many new findings. We can find some of the things we already knew about, but we have a lot of genes that are close to being genome-wide significant. We can take those genes into BioView and look at which ones show with reduced expression, reduced genetically predicted expression, show evidence of being associated with diabetes, glucose traits, insulin traits, you know, across the board, BMI. So, so it's another way to help prioritize the rare variant discoveries, we think. There's a few, just a, a few others that I was going to show you that are kind of fun to look at. So these are not Mendelian disease genes. Um, some of them were just genes like this one that I had some idea what phenotypes should be associated with a cholecystokinin receptor. So indeed, um, biliary disease is associated with re reduced genetically expression, oh, sorry, increased predicted expression of this uh, gene. But what was, what was kind of intriguing was to see the other associations. So this is a receptor not just for regulatory peptides in the gastrointestinal tract, but also in the brain. And you do see um, a few other interesting suicidal ideation, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Hard to know what that means in, in just these 5,000 samples, but when we have more than 100,000, that's going to be a really interesting thing to keep an eye on. Um, 
there's a, there was a gene, GRIC5, that um, looks like an eye super gene. So increased expression of GRIC5 was associated with retinal detachment, cataracts, glaucoma um, of various sorts, disorders of the vitreous body, other retinal disorders. So, and again, that's increased predicted expression, which of course makes it ideal as a drug target um, for, for developing a therapeutic. Reduced predicted expression of this gene, which is um, import, it's, a, it's one of those genes that acts as a, a chaperone for proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum to uh, the Golgi, um, was associated with schizophrenia, with psychosis, with other non with other non psychotic or transient mental disorders, psychogenic and somatoform disorders, and epilepsy, but it has an interesting pattern of association with other things too. So, so you see transient alteration of awareness, thyrotoxicosis, which can sometimes be, uh, uh, I mean, that's delusions in people thought to have thyroid disease, um, lack of normal physiological development, failure to thrive, alteration of con consciousness, and meningitis. So it looks like it just makes brains more sensitive to any kind of insult. So again, you know, I wouldn't make much of it now, but when we have 100,000, this is going to be an interesting one to look at. So, so what I've shown you is just a, a little bit of a flavor. So this is the results of our studies in 5,000 in BioView with the predictions built only through statistical methods. So we're modifying those now to use ENCODE annotations, which should improve the quality of the predictors. Um, within a few weeks, we'll have results with this improved methodology on all genes. In, so we have 125 genes now, all genes in 20,000. And then um, in a year or so, we'll have results in more than 100,000 um, with all genes. So I think it's going to be really fun to use this as a general discovery tool, but to really try to get an understanding of whether altered expression of Mendelian disease genes really does contribute disproportionately to human diseases. So these are our members of our GTEx team, and I need to especially point out Haki M and Eric Gamazon, who have I hope hockey will be um, signing on the dotted line to come and sing in our new Nashville group. So with that, I, I'm, I need to acknowledge my GTEx college colleagues. Which it's a really fantastic project. Um, I, many of you that work in ENCODE know how much fun it can be to work with a like-minded group of, of people on these big projects. But I'm happy to take questions now. Well, I don't think the mic is on, but it should be. You probably have some interesting data also um, taking into account sexual dimorphisms in expression levels. Yeah, so there's a whole group in GTEx working on context specificity with respect to se sex. So Barbara Strange, we, had, we got a, one of those... Um, uh, supplements to really study sex context specificity in GTEx and they've really been doing a ton of work on it. It's one of the things that's challenging with respect, with respect to context specificity, sex and, and even the cis trans thing is how you choose to normalize because actually the, the normalization process and even the way we use peer factors to, prior to general analysis can remove a lot of the sex effects, can remove trans effects clearly also. And so, so I think there's a lot of kind of deep thinking and diving in the exact best way to do this to make sure that we find the sex effects that you know are there. But I think there's some really interesting uh, preliminary studies out already from other groups um, suggesting that the X chromosome is a very, is a, a much more interesting chromosome with respect to uh, sex effects in transcription than, than we 
I mean, not that we should be surprised, but, but really disproportionately interesting. Hi, I'm Catalina Shostak from Penn. Uh, so for the predict scan, so uh, if in my reading, the GTEx, you find two kind of uh, EGs or eSNPs, one that are shared and the others are sort of cell type specific. So do you use that separately? And then the other question is, if you take now the cell type specific eSNPs, do you actually see enrichment for um, diseases that are associated for that specific tissue? Yeah, so, so it's definitely true that um, this is a feature of genetic architecture. So for some diseases, if you don't use the regulatory variation identified very specifically in the right cells and tissues, you don't see anything. Um, and, and so there's a lot of examples in, for neuropsychiatric diseases where you really have to have the regulatory variation from brain in order to see effects. Not true for all, but probably for 80%, 90% of neuropsychiatric disorders, that's true. And, and this cross tissue versus um, single tissue architecture is important as well. So what we've been doing is building both tissue specific predictors as well as a cross tissue predictor. And that's true, so for brain we're building a, so there's several brain regions sampled in GTEx. So we're building brain specific predictors, but also a general cross brain predictor because there's definitely shared architecture. And when you use that shared architecture across multiple tissues from the same set of individuals, you improve your power and, and your resolution for the predictions. So when what you want to study is the cross regulatory architecture using the, this cross tissue sort of predictor is going to be a better idea. When you really need to hone in on the specificity, you want to use the tissue specific. And of course, at some point, through collaborations with the single cell consortium, we hope we'll have even cell type specific. And you can get that for some cell types now. Um, but, but, but for now, the, the tissue definitely helps for diseases that have that sort of architecture. Okay, so I have a few announcements and I'll do these in reverse order. Um, we need to be back here at 10.05 for our next uh, talks, so please be back a few minutes early. We'll have coffee if you go outside and back to the left. I think there will be signs that say how to get there. Um, so we'll, we'll be on break for coffee. And join me again in thanking our keynote speaker, Nancy Cox, for an excellent talk. <laughs>